Hey everyone, it's Rob Ryder on uh, Saturday, March 16th. The year is 2013. And uh, we're going to ask the question can it really be this easy? Here's an example. Of course, looking at this, this is out of Canada. Declaration of Intent to Reside in Quebec Economic Classes. The principal applicant must complete this form. Family name and given names. Given names. You don't see that very often on a on a uh, government form. Your date of birth. Declaration. I declare that my family members and I intend to live in the province of Quebec. I authorize the government of Canada to share all necessary information with respect to my application for permanent residence in Canada, including the decision made on my application with officials of the province of Quebec. Put your signature on it. You just made a declaration that you're going to be a permanent resident of Canada. Permanent residence of Canada. What in the hell is this all about? Well, I'm thinking that what we, everyone needs to do is we need to go to the county clerk and uh, take the naturalization oath because it appears that you know we were given the granted citizenship here in the United States of America but you need to show your intent to have it because you can't be under two sovereign powers and we're also seen as 14th amendment citizens which is a different jurisdiction than an American national and so if you want to be part of the Republic, you have to do a declaration. And so this is for Canada, right? And we'll talk more about it here in a bit, but it's kind of what's driving all this. So in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4, United States Constitution gives the Congress the power to establish uniform rule, a uniform rule of naturalization and the immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 sets forth the legal requirements for acquisition of citizenship of the United States. Again, we've never declared that we're going to accept the gift. Right? We haven't acknowledged the gift. You can be a United States citizen. I acknowledge I can and I'm going to be. Something like that. So this is a certificate of non-citizen nationality. Department of State occasionally receives requests for certificates of non-citizen national status pursuant to some section of the Immigration Nationality Act. As the title certificate indicates, only persons who qualify are non-citizen national, i.e. person who is a U.S. national but not a U.S. citizen, is eligible to apply for such a certificate. Very few persons fall within this category since, as defined by the INA, all U.S. citizens are U.S. nationals. But only a relatively small number of persons acquire U.S. nationality <clears throat> without becoming U.S. citizens. So you could read that, that, um, right? without becoming U.S. citizen. So you're going to go and accept being a U.S. citizen. That will give you the nationality as a United, a citizen of the United States of America. We'll see. As the department has received few requests, there is no justification for creation of a non-citizen national certificate. And this, we were looking at this summer when we we're looking at domicile stuff, because that's what that permanent residence is. It's determining your dom domicile. And domicile is a real simple concept except they made it a little difficult. They said, yeah, it is permanent residence, and, or, or it's residence and the intention of not leaving. You need to express your intent that you're making this your permanent residence. Or, as they said here, application for permanent residence in Canada. Okay. Out of the National Archives, naturalization is a process in which aliens become American citizens. It's a voluntary act. Naturalization is not required. 
of the four born persons listed, uh, yeah, yeah, 25% had not become naturalized or filed their first papers. I got something called first papers. And there's more of this by this location of naturalization records. This Claire lady, she's over the National Archives, right? She probably knows a bit about this. From the first naturalization, naturalization law passed in 1790 through much of the 20th century, an alien could be become naturalized in any court of record. Thus, most persons went to the court most convenient, convenient to them, usually a county court. County courts have jurisdiction over naturaliza naturalization. And the clerk of the county is the clerk of the court of the county. The names and types of courts vary from state to state. The names and types of courts have also varied during different periods of history, but may include the county supreme, the circuit, the district, the equity, the chancery, the probate, or the common pleas court. Jeepers, I wonder which one of those it could be. I bet you have one of those in your county. Most researchers will find that their ancestors became nationalized in one of these courts. A few state supreme courts also nationalized aliens. Uh, it would be Indiana, Idaho, Iowa, Maine, New Jersey, and South Dakota. Aliens who lived in large cities sometimes became naturalized in a federal court, such as a U.S. district or U.S. circuit. So I think that's how they, you know, they, they print, pretend to do it now. They have all these people go to the U.S. district court, 300 people in a room, raise their hand. They take uh, the naturalization oath, and when they get done, they get something that looks like this, a certificate of naturalization. And uh, this is Rose. And this is what they say. Now this eagle here is in gold. It says it's a very beautiful piece of paper, actually, so I've been told. Personal description of holder as of date of naturalization, date of birth, sex, right? All this is upper, lower case, nice script. Look. Country of former national, na nationality, Lithuania. All right? And so... <coughs> This number up here is in red. Now the county clerk, when Rose showed this to her county clerk, and that will be on an audio I'm putting out, the conversation we had with her latest conversation with the county clerk. Um, he was very, you know, he'd never, no one had ever brought one of these to him before. And she wanted to have it recorded. Because this says that I certify that the description given is true and the photograph here too is a likeness of me she signed it, complete and true signature of holder, be it known that pursuant to an application filed with the Attorney General at Chicago, Illinois, the Attorney General having found that Roe, then residing in the United States, intends to reside in the United States when so required by the naturalization laws of the United States and had in all other respects complied with the application provisions of such naturalization laws and was entitled entitled I love that word entitled to be admitted to citizenship such person having taken the oath of allegiance in a ceremony conducted by the US District Court Northern District at Chicago Illinois that such person is admitted as a citizen of the United States of America citizen of the United States of America from the Commissioner of Immigration and Naturalization. I really think we all want to have one that says that. We have, want to record it in the county recorder's or the county clerk's office. So, you know, you people who've been naturalized go to the ceremony, get this piece of paper, it's a nice looking certificate. Well, what are you supposed to do with it? Do they just give it to you to hang on your wall? Or is it really pretty and have gold on it? You know, a gold eagle, red numbers, uh, highly scriptive. For another reason, like it's a lawful document. And that if we were to take this, because this is the first step, you took the oath. Now what you need to do is go claim your personal, your, your uh, permanent residence in a city because really you want to be a citizen of a city as part of this as we'll go through this further but okay um, 
but it can happen in lots of places. Now this is in California, naturalization and citizenship history. Naturalization proceedings were under the jurisdiction of the district court, a state court, not a federal court, until 1880, and then the county clerk was the clerk of both of these courts. Oh, the county court was also given this responsibility uh, in 1862. The county clerk was the clerk of both of these courts and kept the records. 1872, state statute required the clerk to keep two alphabetical lists of records, one for declaration and one for admission to citizenship. We want to put in a declaration and we want to be admitted for citizenship. In 1880, the district and county courts were discontinued and the Superior Court took over all their functions, including naturalization. The county clerk was also the clerk of this court. That county clerk is a clerk of, right, the district court, the county court, the, uh, and now the Superior Court. The, dis, the, the county clerk, or case county clerk. could actually be the clerk sitting on the court as far as that goes. I don't know who the lowercase county clerk is exactly. It's one of those things we like to find out. I think it's the clerk of the court of record when I look at my documents because of the way it's written on the document. And we'll look at one of those later. Uh, general rule is a two-step process. Well, of course, you got to do two things. As a general rule, naturalization has a two-step process. It took a minimum of five years. I had to resign in the United States for two years. The alien could file a declaration of intent, so-called first papers. So your declaration of intent is step one. After three more years, you could petition for naturalization. You need to open a case. After the petition was granted, a certificate of citizenship was issued to the alien. These two steps did not have to take place in the same court. As a general rule, the Declaration of Intent, which was the first papers, generally contained more geologically useful information than the petition. The declaration may include the alien's month, year uh, of immigration to the United States. Okay, so the petition doesn't have much on it, and so this first papers could be your certificate of live birth. In my opinion, that's the first papers because it has on there, it has both jurisdictions listed, um, in my opinion. Okay, so going on, the first major exception was the derivative citizenship was granted to wise and minor children for nationalized men. Oh, okay, well, yeah, you should be able to do it that way. We just give it to their wives and their children. It would make sense because the domicile is supposed to follow the father. Uh, from 1790 to 1840, children under the age of 21 automatically became naturalized citizens upon the naturalization of their father. That was up till 1940. Unfortunately, however, names and biological included the declaration of petitions filed. Uh, okay, so after 1940, you were no longer automatically became a naturalized citizen. I guess you needed to show your intent. The second major exception to the general rule is uh, minor aliens who had lived in the United States for five years before their 23rd birthday could file both their declarations and petitions at the same time. Okay, so we could do that. If we're minor aliens or we were born as minor aliens and we've been here for more than five years, we can file our declaration and petition at the same time. I'm no longer a minor. The third exception, uh, special consideration given to veterans. The 1862 allow law and honorably discharged veterans of any war to petition for naturalization. And uh, I don't know if uh, I put it in the video or not, but when we were looking through the Recorder Act or the Recorder Statutes in uh, Illinois, it talked about how your DD-214, which is your discharge papers, isn't seen as a public record. They went into this great long thing about why that is, and here's why it is, because then they would have to make you a citizen of the United States of America. If you have that DD-214, you can go and um, petition for naturalization, and that's your evidence. But you haven't petitioned for the naturalization yet. Okay, the records. It's impossible to find hard, fast rules content. Uh, I got to kind of read through this fast. Got lots of pages. Thus, the declaration of intention in some courts consists merely of a bare statement of the intention, name of 
allegiance of the alien. In a majority of courts, alien applicants are not required to make a declaration of intention required by law. In other courts, he is. Uh, in the majority of courts, alien applications are not required to make a declaration of intention required by law. Well, if it's required by law, how can you not be required to make it? I don't understand that one. I think I'm going to go ahead and do it if it's required by law. You got to make a declaration, right? That's what they're doing here. You're making a declaration. That's all this is. Declaration of intent to reside in Quebec. It's required by law. Make a declaration. All right. Uh, previous 1903, the majority of courts did not require petitions or affidavits. Looks like you need to do a petition and affidavits. Other courts did. Some courts keep a naturalization record separate from other records. Yeah, got all different ways of doing it, right? Some records contain full histories of aliens, but majority of the records show only the name, nationality, oath of allegiance, and date of admission. Okay. In 1903, the exam... This is a investigator talking about these records. The examination of records disclosed the remarkable fact that never since the first enactment of the naturalization laws has any record been made in any court of the names of the minor children who, under the operation of the statutes, were made citizens by naturalization of their parents. So no matter when your ancestor came, right, the next set of children weren't naturalized. County court records, uh, okay, most cur current county employees are probably not genealogists and may not be familiar with the court's older records. Okay, well, you know, they're going to tell you that they only have certain, we only have death certificates and birth certificates. Ah, bullshit, you got all the certificates. That's what the county clerk does is issue certificates. They got all kinds of them. They got certificates of intent, uh, certificate of tax sale, and, 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 and. Yeah, this is from Utah. To become a citizen of the United States, an individual normally filed a declaration of intention to become a citizen at least two years prior. Okay, like I said before, the next step was naturalization hearing at which the candidates and witnesses either made oral statements or filed written petitions and affidavits attesting to the applicant's character, worthiness to become a citizen and validity of the statements made to the court. Put in a petition with an affidavit from a witness saying you're a good guy. If the judge found the applicant eligible to become a citizen, an oath was administered and the individual renounced his former citizenship. At this point, a certificate of citizenship was issued documenting the fact. Certificate of... Uh, certificate of citizenship and this is a certificate of naturalization but not a certificate of citizenship I think it would allow Roe to get a certificate of citizenship it's her evidence but we want a certificate of citizenship uh, the declarations of intentions have links for the insertion of individuals names as former sovereign date signature of individual court clerk witnessing the statement who's your former sovereign that would be your father right who's your daddy that's who goes there hey, they left him off the other paperwork hey who's your dad we never got his name well, we're gonna give it to you now the certificates of citizenship which constituted the second half of I may these Okay, so these would be, see, in Utah now, this is the archives we're talking about in uh, the second half of IMA, document aliens' application for citizenship. Each form gives the date, ruler's name, names of those testifying, and a standardized summary of the procedures. Man, this is like, you know, the other half of the certificate of live birth, it only has your mother on it. What did dad do? that would be on its own piece of paper that we never see because again that's who the ruler's name is names of those testifying and standardized just like 
you know, people testified on your certificate of live birth. Your mother was the informant. The doctor was supposed to sign. You got a signature of the clerk. Those are all testifying to something. Now, like on mine, they're all blank, but should have had stuff in there. Uh, two U.S. citizens testified that the applicant had, okay, you got to bring two witnesses. Two U.S. Two US citizens testified that an applicant had resided in the territory for a year. Okay, so who are the, if there are no U.S. citizens right now, for the rest of us, who would they be? I think people like the county clerk and the chief judge and the circuit court clerk, they've all taken the correct oath and they are United States citizens. They've taken an oath of office. And Bobby in Arizona found uh, there's a file called the loyalty oath. And in the loyalty oath, when you open it up, it's got judges and clerks in there. And they've taken the oath that looks the closest to being what you would take from the Constitution, period, with nothing else added. Except for the military. They're also taking probably the correct oath. But the guys that run your township aren't. And we got to kind of go through this. Now this says, now this is uh, in Utah, the probate court, right? The probate court's got the frickin' records. Could have been a district court, could be a probate court. At the end of the day, the county clerk is the clerk of the court. And we need to go see the county clerk to give her a petition. File a petition with the clerk. File a complaint with the clerk. We're going to be talking about that in the next video. 8 U.S.C. Application for Naturalization. An applicant for naturalization shall make and file with the Attorney General a sworn application in writing and shall include adverments to the facts and what's an adverment as the concluding part of a plea containing new affirmative matter. And that's basically where you say that you've read the above and um, uh, you swear an oath that to the best of your knowledge and belief, everything that the foregoing is true. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to go study this closer. 8 U.S.C. 1445. This pretty much tells you what you need to do, right, to, for your application for naturalization, declaration of intention. An oath of allegiance administered other than in public ceremony before the Attorney General or a court. So you can either do it before the Attorney General or before a court. Other than that, then they have some special things. You don't need to do it in front of the Attorney General or a court. Nothing in the subsection shall be construed as requiring any such alien to make and file a declaration of intention as condition precedent for filing an application for naturalization. I'm going to file all of them, right? I'm not going to leave anything out. I'm going to go through it and just file it like it's a cookbook and bake a cake. Nor shall any such declaration of intention be regarded as conferring or having conferred upon any such alien United States citizenship or nationality or right to the United States citizenship or nationality. Okay, so the declaration of intention doesn't do that. You need to have a um, certificate of citizenship. Until you have that, you don't have uh, you don't have the citizenship. So this is the uh, naturalization oath. I here die here hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and adjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been subject or citizen. You've been a Fourteenth Amendment citizen then I will support and defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And the part that's in yellow, you don't need to take. That's about bearing arms and being part of the military. It says in here you don't need to do that, right? This is the part you need to take an oath to. See, right now you're under a foreign prince. You're under President Obama. He's over the democracy. It's a different nationality. It's a different citizenship. All right, we're leaving that. We're going to the republic where Obama isn't our president. We vote for the president to be over the democracy. We're not in the democracy. 
And one of the things that this guy asked Roe, uh, the county clerk, after looking, you know, after talking about this certificate of naturalization that she has, and that she's from Lithuania and Lithuanian food and everything else, he asked her, he said, well, were you born in the county? Right? And that's a strange thing to say, were you born in the county? After knowing and talking to her about being from Lithuania, right? And you could look at vital statistics, it's just a list of the births and deaths. But who says your birth can't move, right? If you're a ship, vessel, you're going to go birth in a different nation. You're going to go pick one. Let's see. Before 1906, there were as many as 5,000 courts with naturalization jurisdiction. Each court could develop its own procedures for administering the oath. Some courts simply documented the applicants sworn an oath. Other courts chose to write and print their own text for the oath, which the applicant would read at the final hearing. You can so do your own. So the idea is, right, we're going to make something up, put this oath on it, go down to the county clerk, have them swear, swear us in, and give it to them. So there. All right, that's my certificate of intent, or my declaration of intent. Cool. And this is, uh, you know, just goes on and on and on. Most of this is um, coming off the naturalization site and Wikipedia. Declaration of Intention, also called First Papers. So, if you were born in America, right, you're, you're a Native American, and uh, you, know, you got something like this. At least I do. This is my certificate of live birth. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about that in just a second here. A declaration of intention normally preceded proof of residence or a petition to become a citizen by two or more years. Exceptions a person who entered the county while a minor. Right? The country while a minor. All right, so look at this here. Yeah, where is this thing? Oh, it isn't this one that says it. Shit. On my other document, it has uh, state of Michigan upper, upper case and then county of bay, county being lowercase, of being lowercase, bay being proper case as the two jurisdictions that it's in. Okay, so a declaration of intention. Beginning in 1795, a person could declare their intent to become a citizen at any time after they arrived in the United States. Okay, a declaration of intention required ended in 1952, although immigrants can still file a declaration if they want to. I think it's a smart thing. Naturalization petitions. Following the declaration of intention and meeting the residency requirements, the applicant filed this petition for formal application for U.S. citizenship. Naturalization petition. That's what Roe did, I think. I think that's what this is. It's a certificate of naturalization. She put in a petition, she got the certificate. There's also a thing called certificates of arrival. On this form, the immigrant listed the port name, date, ship, arrival. Copies of this form were sent to the port of entry and checked by the clerk who located the immigrant's passenger list. In a corresponding record was found, the INS issued certificate of arrival and sent it to the naturalization court. Certificates of arrival were first issued under the basic naturalization act. See, I think this is your certificate of live birth. It's a certificate of arrival. It says when you were when you were birthed, and it went to the naturalization court, which would be the county court that you're in. Here it is. See, two different jurisdictions: state of Michigan and Bay County, Bay City, Michigan. Certified copy of a record. All right, so he's the clerk of the county of Bay and the circuit court thereof, the <clears throat> said being a court of record. That makes it also a uh, naturalization court.
So we have the certificate of arrival, but we haven't taken the oath. The document granting U.S. citizenship to peti uh, records of naturalization is oath of allegiance. The document granting U.S. citizenship to petitioners, sometimes called certificate of naturalization, um, like this, right? That's what we're trying to get to. We need those of us who haven't taken the oath still need to do that. And there's this odd thing called hyphenated America. Is in the United States the term hyphenated America is an epith commonly used uh, to disparage Americans who were of foreign birth or origin and who displayed an allegiance to a foreign, foreign country, 14th Amendment citizen. It was most commonly used to disparage uh, American Germans, yeah, so-called. President Theodore Roosevelt was an outspoken anti uh, hyphenate, and Woodrow Wilson followed suit. The term hyphenated American was published in 1889, commonly as a derogatory term. Anyways, what did Teddy say? There is no room in this country for hyphenated Americanism. When I refer to hyphenated Americans, I do not refer to naturalized Americans. Some of the best Americans I've ever known were naturalized Americans, Americans born abroad. A hyphenated American is not an American at all. The one absolutely certain way of bringing this nation to ruin, of preventing all possibility of its continuing to be a nation at all, would be to permit it to become tangled, a tangle of squabbling nationalities, an intricate knot of German Americans, Irish, English, each preserving separate nationality, like a 14th Amendment citizen, than with the other citizens of the American Republic. We need to take an oath to the American Republic, the United States of America, and renounce your 14th Amendment citizenship. Woodrow Wilson said, any man who carries a hyphen about him carries a dagger that he is ready to plunge in the vitals of the Republic whenever he gets ready. Citizenship, the link between a person and a state. A person who does not have citizenship in any state is said to be stateless. Roman idea of citizenship. Romans realized that granting citizenship to people from all over the empire legitimized Rome's rule over conquered areas. Roman citizenship is no longer a status of political agency. It has been reduced to a judicial safeguard and an expression of rule and law. Rome carried forth Greek ideas of citizenship which such as the principles of equity, equality under the law, includes chances for lesser forms of citizenship. A citizen came to be understood as a person free to act by law, free to ask and expect the law's protection. We need to be a citizen of the Republic. And to do that, you need to take a loyalty oath, or an oath of allegiance, or whatever you want to call it. A citizen of such, in such a legal community and such and such a legal standing is that in that community. <clears throat> citizenship meant citizenship meant having rights to have possessions. Right, we're trying to get possession of the legal title to our property. Somebody else is holding it right now, right? Well, we have the right to possessions once we become a citizen. We have immunities, expectations, which were available in many kinds and degrees, available or unavailable to many kinds of persons for many kinds of reasons, right? They're either they're available or they're not to different kinds of degrees depending on your citizenship. And we're a citizen of the democracy and the democracy is at war with the United States of America. So in the United States of America, a 14th Amendment citizen is seen as an enemy of the state. Well, show your allegiance. Now, this is where it gets interesting. So in Middle Ages, uh, during the European Middle Ages, citizenship was usually associated with cities. Nobility used to have privi privileges above com commoners, but the French Revolution and other revolutions revoked these privileges and made citizens. And one of those other revolutions would have been the English Civil War. 
During the Renaissance, people transitioned from being subjects of a king or queen to being citizens of a city and later to a nation. Each city had its own law, courts, and independent administration. And uh, when you look at Rose paperwork, it's coming from two different courts. One of them says it's uh, 16th Judicial Circuit. Um, can't remember the name of the city. Uh, Kane County. And the other one was just Kane County. It's two different courts. One of them is in the city. Each city has its own law courts and independent administration. This is the court where they're opening these cases against you and then they're bringing it over to the court that we walk into to a different jurisdiction to try to get their judgment from the other court enforced. City dwellers who had fought alongside nobles in battles to defend their cities were no longer content with having a subordinate social status but demanded a greater role in the form of citizenship. The rise of citizenship was linked to the rise of republic republicanism did not signify a submissive relationship with a lord or count. And you can get a really cool feeling for this if you watch these three videos on YouTube about the English Civil War. Because as it turned out, Oliver Cromwell became um, oh, protector of the nation or something like that for 10 years when they didn't have a king. And he was in charge of the military and the military kind of took over the government. And they made everybody a citizen or right to citizenship. The modern idea of citizenship still respects the idea of political participation, but is usually done through elaborate systems of political representation at a distance. Yeah, represented a democracy. In a, in a republic, the, um, the power resides in the people, comma, or their representatives. Well, be one of the people, don't be represented. If you're represented, you're in the democracy. Citizenship status under social contract theory carries with both rights and responsibility. In this sense, citizenship is described as a bundle of rights. That's the same thing that incorporeal hereditaments are called, a bundle of rights. Primarily politi political participation in the life of the community, the right to vote, and the right to receive certain protection from the community as well as obligations. So you're going to pay your general taxes and you're going to have the protection from the community which means now that that city attorney because that's where you're going to declare your residence the city attorney or the county attorney if it needs to be is going to be your attorney and when they say you need to hire an attorney you can say I already have I'm a citizen of the United States of America just like title insurance, go read your title insurance policy. They have a duty to defend your title, right? If I have the title of citizen in the United States of America, they have a duty to defend my title. I don't have to be under anybody else's jurisdiction. If I'm a citizen in the United States of America, then my government has a duty to defend my title of a citizen. As a bond, Citizenship is a bond, extends beyond the basic kingship ties to unite people of different genetic backgrounds. It usually signifies membership in a political body. It is often based on the result of some form of military service or expectations of future service. Citizenship is a status in society. When there are many different groups within a nation, citizenship may be the only real bond which unites everybody as equals without discrimination. It is a broad bond, your oath and bond. You're going to sign your paperwork, that's a bond. You're going to have citizenship, that's a bond. And now everybody who's a citizen is bound to each other. And there are certain people who have taken offices in the government and they're bound to protect you. It is a broad bond linking a person with the state and gives people a universal identity as a legal member of a specific nation. The liberalist individualist, it assumes people act for the purposes of enlightened, enlightened self-interest. According to this viewpoint, citizens are sovereign. Their primary focus is on economic betterment. 
According to this formulation, the state exists for the benefit of the citizens and has an obligation to respect and protect the rights of the citizens, including the civil rights and political rights. And then there's this other one called the Civic Republican, which is, you know, kind of what runs the show now. Emphasizes man's political nature and sees citizenship as an active process, not a passive state or legal maker. Right, if you're not involved, if you're not making the rules, then you know you have nothing to say about it, is what they're saying. It is relatively more concerned that the government will interfere. Right, they want to make sure the government interferes with the popular places to practice citizenship. They're trying to disrupt that. That's what they've done. So we're going to undo it. We're going to go do the easy thing, put in an oath that says that we're citizens of the United States of America. And we want our certificates. Citizenship can be seen as a special elite status. Citizenship is based on the extent that a person can control one's own destiny within a group in the sense of being able to influence the government of the group. So there's nothing wrong with being a voter if you're voting for the president, right? We don't want to vote for somebody to vote for us for the president. I'm not voting to be represented. I want to be a voter that votes for the president. The Canadian Citizenship Act of 1947 provided a distinct Canadian citizenship automatically conferred upon individuals born in Canada with some exceptions and defined the conditions under which one could be a naturalized citizen. Right? Define the, so the Canadian Citizenship Act 1947 is what you Canucks need to read. The concept of Commonwealth citizenship was introduced in 1848 in the British Nationality Act. UK, British Nationality Act, 1948. Other dominions adopted this principle, such as New Zealand, by way of the British Nationality of New Zealand Citizenship Act of 1948. We just need to do that. Dual nationality, when a single person has formal relationship with two separate sovereigns, sovereign states. This may occur, for example, if a person's parents are nationals of separate countries, and the mother's country claims all offspring of the, as the mothers as their own nationals, but the father's country claims all offspring of the fathers. And so on this here, they put uh, usual residence of mother and they put my mom in the all caps jurisdiction Michigan Bay Auburn right they put her in the all caps jurisdiction that's why dad is not here he's not in this nation right he's his paperwork for you is going to be on the other side of the the father's country claims all offspring as the father's the mother's country claims all offspring as the mother's and if they put you into the 14th amendment citizens side then you got two different jurisdictions that are you know I think they have a jurisdiction over you they both claim you nationality is the historical origins and allegiance to a sovereign monarch uh, becoming a national is one state required rejecting the previous state. Becoming a national of one state required rejecting the previous state. Multiple citizenship is a status in which a person is concurrently regarded as a citizen under laws of more than one state. Multiple citizenship exists because different countries use different and not necessarily mutually exclusive citizenship requirements. Colloquial speech refers to persons holding multiple citizenship but technically each nation makes claim to that this person be considered its national for a person to be a citizen of one or more countries or even no country technically each nation makes claim that the person be considered its national you you know again we're seeing them both and in Canada they have a fraudulent use of certificates of citizenship I'm just pointing this out because this is in the uh, criminal code looks like 58 you know then apparently they exist. A certificate of citizenship does exist of naturalization. And then this just shows that Cumberland County, PA, they have a naturalization court. All right, this is a county court. We conduct naturalization court once a year. 
All right, that's what they normally do, but I'm sure if we go in there and say, well, you're going to hold it today, they probably will. Anyways, that was a lot of stuff, right? But um, it's what I've been working on. This whole journey for me is to find that answer. And I keep chuckling because a year and a half or so ago when um, somebody was nice enough to put up Rob's quarter record and we were talking about acknowledging the deeds, a, apparently a judge posted there. And he was saying, you know, that at first he didn't understand what we were trying to do, and now that he did, and he says it really sounds a lot like the old Roman slave system, where um, when the Romans released all the slaves, for them to be free and be a Roman citizen, all they needed to do was make a declaration. And that's really what we're doing. However, it must be under oath for this reason. In a book on the Court of Chancery, it says that a declaration, which is just you saying that you swear or that um, you don't swear to it, you declare under penalty of perjury without, without having an oath administered, that that is a graven image. But when you do a bill of complaint, which would be the same document, except you put it under oath, it's seen as a living being. And so we need to put our documents under oath, and I think that's going to go into the county clerk's office, and we're trying to get a certificate of citizenship and make sure it's recorded in the county clerk's office, and you've arrived. And, and part of that is that we're going to have to... Um, determine what city is our residence because your residence is the city and it could be a township could be a city could be a district who knows what it is they know what it is first of all we got to become one of them and they can then they can tell us who we need to talk to I think that's the other thing we're seen as foreigners that's their theory right we're foreigners they can't tell us you know there's certain things that we have no business knowing once you become a citizen of the United States of America, now they're bound to protect you. They're going to tell us how to do it. But we're going to claim a residence in a city, and um, we may have to post a surety bond. If we had a surety bond posted right now in the county, they would have something to attach other than going after your estate whenever somebody puts a lien on. Somebody puts a $5 lien on it, on your property, they put it on your entire property because there's no bond to protect it. You don't have any surety bond. So we may have to put up a surety bond. I think in Michigan, the county clerk's surety bond is like $3,000 and she's over the whole county. How much can it be for one man? Good stuff coming up. Next one's going to be on court stuff because we're not quite done with that. But uh, I wanted to get this out. See ya.